Is that working now? Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> so thanks for the invite, thanks for the audience, and thanks for the mates up in the north on the web. Um, just to point out, as Tim did, um, I've just written a book called Bittersweet Brexit, that's one of the reasons I'm here. Um, is it echoing? Yes. So what do I do? Just carry on. Just carry on, okay. <laughs> right. Um, and I've got my book, it's half price tonight, mates rates. <laughs> And there's the Twitter handles and hashtags and all that if you want to do that while I'm, while I'm talking. Um, before the referendum, I went, I was speaking at a conference organised by the Kindling Trust and the Food Ethics Council, where I was making the case that, so to put, I'll put my cards on the table straight away, that we should remain in the EU because in terms of protection of soils and labour, then I thought we were better off inside and out. And I'll come back to that. Rather more importantly, though, was the guy speaking after me, a guy called Peter from Nourish in Scotland, who some of you may know. Richie. Richie, is it, yeah. And he said, do you know, the trouble is, you lot are trying to make a decision about Brexit in two and a half months. <coughs> We've just spent two and a half years trying to decide what the Scottish re referendum. And he said, the trouble is, it was only the last couple of months, he said, where we actually got to start talking about our identity and where we want to be and where we want to go. He said, you haven't got a hope in hell of discussing that in two and a half months. And I thought when he said it, I thought, oh no, I can see what's going to happen now. And sure enough, it did. And I want to come back to that point he was making about identity right at the end. But in order to talk, I want to talk about labour in particular, the role of labour, as Tim spelled out. And in order to do that, I need to speak of, of the role of capital, because capital determines what labour conditions there are. And one of the things I want to have a real go at is this mantra about leaving it to the markets. Um, the thing is with markets is, as night follows day, if there's a shortage, the price goes up. If there's a surplus, the price comes down. Everybody knows this. Yet, for some reason, ignores it when it comes to food. And yet, old Bill Shakespeare, 400 years ago, in a play we can't name, actually mentions this. Uh, the porter at the doors of hell, he says he was talking to this farmer who committed suicide on the expectation of plenty. In other words, that farmer thought he was going to be all right, and a good harvest, he didn't. It was awful. He committed suicide. So Bill knew about it then, but we seem to forget about it. Oh, it works that way. So the thing is, with these markets, based on the markets, because the crisis comes down, we keep producing more to try and make up for it. So actually, the general thing across the world is there are saturated markets. And capital is more concerned about having saturated markets than it is about having saturated fats. So we have a saturated market system, um, and when I hear people say, oh, we've got a, this 7 billion of us, it's going to be 9 billion, and then it's going to be 11, we've got to produce more and more food, I'm going, no, 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 no. We could easily produce enough food now. In fact, there's enough food in the world now to feed 14 billion. It's that. The problem is how to make money out of a market which isn't delivering the, the price is back. So, this, the problem for the big food producers in the world is overproduction, not underproduction. It's not overpopulation, it's overproduction. And just look back at the United States since the Second World War. They have been trying to deal with this massive problem of overproduction. In the first instance, they had the Marshall Plan, which dumped lots of grain on Europe. And then they learned that was to be their foreign policy. I won't go into that, but you can pick me up on that. The EU, since the 1970s, has been dealing with overproduction. Some of you may remember the line lakes and the butter mountains, what have you. And so the two big blocks in the world overproduce. And to show that the markets don't work, each of them subsidises their farmers to the tune of about $50 billion or euros. And yet both of them carry on as if the mantra of the markets is going to sort things out. It isn't. It's the problem, not the answer. 
just to emphasise the overproduction, look at the globe, globe, I call it globesity, the worldwide problem of obesity. That's part of the problem uh, coming out of overproduction. We talk about the massive amounts of waste in food, so like a third of all food produced is wasted. That's again a product of overproduction. So, it's the, what the problem for the capital is how does it keep accumulating? It's got a, I would call it a voracious appetite to keep accumulating, but the trouble is, it doesn't eat enough. You could shovel a lot more down to keep that process going. And for me, this was an incredible realisation. From about the age of 12, I've checked this out with my family, I was a nerd that wanted to feed the world. I steered myself to grammar school, to university, to do an agricultural science degree, then on to a master's, then on to a PhD, all the time wanting to help feed the world. So can you imagine when I realised that is not the problem? It was like, I described it as like being a Christian in church and suddenly realising there wasn't a God. Luckily for me, some bishop in Brazil said that, that when, when I feed the hungry, I'm told I'm an angel. But if I ask the question, why are they hungry, I'm considered a communist. And that's kind of the change which occurred to me. So, food capital has to go to a, a lot more lengths than most other capital. Because Tim mentioned the treadmill. Producers find it harder and harder to make a profit. So, what do you do? You, try, you produce more. That's where the produce more comes in. So, you produce more thinking you're going to make up for it. But of course, once you've got this new technique to make more, whatever it is, then all the other farmers can do more as well. So you find they're making more as well, so you have to make more, more efficiently. And this is the treadmill that goes on and on and on. And there is only one way out, that's to get off the treadmill. And just to remind you that this market madness, I'm not the only one talking about this. This was coming up to the referendum. This is a the head of the uh, Tenant Farmers Association. He said, I stand here representing the tenanting sector of agriculture and farm fairy farms up down this country. And we produce good food safety, high standards of welfare, but feel disenfranchised, marginalised and stolen from. This is what a lot of farmers feel. And he said, at the same time, I'm sorry to say that our policy makers are chasing the fantasy that the free market is the answer to our plight. He could see it wasn't. Even Bill Clinton could see that. World Food Day in 2008-2009 said food should not be treated like a commodity like all the others. It's too important for that. That was a bit galling coming from him because in the 1990s he'd freed up the markets, what's called the futures markets, which is where people in the food chain bet on the future price of their goods so that if something went wrong then they'd have some returns. He opened up those markets to the rest of the globe. So anybody who wanted to gamble on the food markets did. And as I say, while well, it's saturated markets, there isn't that much going on. But come the 2007-2008 financial crash, a lot moved out of mortgages into food. The price of food hiked up. And you, you can chase the Arab risings to that period of time. The Arab countries were paying a lot more for their food because they were on the world market. They'd stopped producing a lot of their own food. But that's another story. But there, and if, by the way, if that character there looks like that character, total accident. <laughs> this is Blair at the local party conference. He's saying, what we can't do is pretend it is not happening. I hear people say, we have to stop and debate globalism. You might as well debate whether autumn is going to fall out or summer. But then he said, look at all those other countries. Wait for the South Americans, look at Vietnam. All these nations have labour costs a fraction of ours. And that's where he did nail it. In other words, we want this global free market, this neoliberal attitude, because their labour is cheaper than ours. In other words, we can get stuff in cheaper. And therein lies a lot of our problems. Because that, a lot of people are saying this process of globalisation is it, left behind a lot of people, and that is what has led to Trump's victory in Brexit. Big debate there, but I can't help but feel there's something in that. One of the ways capital has 
try to deal with this, is the EU. And inside the EU, there is something we all hear about called the single market. And I've put up there a table to try and explain what the single market does. I'll come to the legs later on, but the top is the single market. And that, what that means is that food can move across that table, water, all the condiments. And we know that the standards of hygiene and safety and pesticides and whatever are much the same across Europe. So we can buy whatever we like from some other country. We know it's a decent standard. The thing is, to invest in those standards takes quite a lot of persuading. To mention that you know, the straight bananas and all that. And there's a whole list of complaints that farmers and food producers have had about what the EU has dictated those standards should be. The thing is, what's missing from this debate at the moment is to enable, to invest you need the confidence to make that sure that investment is worthwhile. To improve the animal standards and those pesticide standards and what have you, you have to believe that it's worthwhile. And the only way that's going to happen is by having a market where your product is guaranteed. You can sell into that market knowing that that is accepted. That same single market also has around it the same standards for people abroad to have to conform to. And in WTO language, they're called phytosanitary standards. And these are about health and safety and environment. What I find lacking in some of the debate at the moment is the idea that somehow we can come out of the single market and stay close to it and yet maintain the standards. If we come out of the, stand the, the single market, there's no incentive for people to stay to those standards. If you're outside the single market, you're going to have to compete with the rest of the world. And that means one thing, cheaper food and lowering the standards. The idea some people seem to be going on about is we can somehow legislate for better stand those standards. Who's going to go around inspecting? We don't, the EHOs have gone. The health and safety executive haven't got any inspectors left to do this stuff. You know, and anyway, everybody screams about red tape and regulations. It's, it can't be done by regulation. It can only be done because the market makes it worth investing. The other ways to, for capital to try and deal with everything in terms of food, the main one we all hear about is value-adding. It sounds good, doesn't it? Or we add value. Well, most of the time it extracts value if you're talking about nutrition and health. But the just to sort of let you know, the, the idea of that is if you buy beans from abroad, coffee, cocoa, whatever, and then roast them and process them and then sell them as a cup of coffee, you obviously make a lot more money because you have added value. That's, that's what the word means. But the way it gets translated is more and more processing goes on. So that in Britain, we now, 50% of our food is now what's called ultra-processed. We've taken that further than anybody else in Europe could have a discussion about why that is. The other way of increasing, getting rid of, you know, dealing with this uh, overproduction is obviously feeding to other creatures. And hence, you've got the development of intensive uh, meat production, which most of us are pretty well against. Um, but again, that's coming from the overproduction of food to feed, some, uh, feed other creatures. Then there's a way of just making lots of ways to keep prices up. I'll come to an example of that in a minute. But uh, so the novel of vegetables, the, the standards themselves, lots of ways that actually create waste. That means there's less to sell on the market and you can keep the price adjust. The most obvious one is to get people to eat more. And we can see the result of that in terms of global obesity. But the most significant, and this is the one I want to concentrate on, is if you're looking for ways of saving money on food, it's labour costs which kick in the most. It's a large proportion of the growing costs. And just, this isn't just this country, it's about everywhere in the world, at all times, food workers and farm workers have been badly paid from the grapes of wrath onwards, you know, the people, and through Roman times. People who work in the food and farm sector always seem to be badly off. Is that what's going on? Hello? Can I see? Okay. Is 
that working? Lovely. <laughs> okay, right. Sorry for that little intermission. Um, the th and the thing is, a lot of the people that work in the food chain, that's throughout the world, actually go hungry. When you hear the figures of a billion people starving, it's estimated that about half of them actually work in the food chain. It's, they can't afford to f buy the food they produce. Even in the UK, it's estimated there's something like 2,000 modern slaves working in the food and farm industry. That's not my figure, that's the government figure when they introduced the Modern Slavery Act a few years ago. The thing is, Tim mentioned about migrant workers, we'll talk about them in the fields in a minute, but as he said, a lot of the food manufacturing industry is, re, re, um, is dependent on migrant workers. Virtually all abattoirs consist of foreign workers, but lots in the meal manufacturers, I'm thinking of Moy Park and places in Northern Ireland, just migrant workers run the machines. And it's, what, I'm, what we'll see is that UK food and farm workers actually face more competition than, say, French and German farm workers, because a lot more food is coming in to this country than those countries. And my prediction is, as Tim suggests, is it's going to get worse if we have any form of Brexit. To give you an idea, this is something I came across just recently, that the supermarkets pay wages such that the workers have to be subsidised in terms of what was then the, the various benefits. I, I would like to see this firmed up now with universal credit, but all the signs are that the supermarkets are using benefit systems to subsidise their workers' wages. I think it's appalling that that happens, but also the demeaning nature of it. Why don't we, in a sense, why don't we pay the supermarkets the money directly to pay their workers? At least then they would have a decent uh, way of receiving them instead of the demeaning way of having to go through the credit system. It's interesting, Aldi were the only ones then paying a living wage. But what I want to come down to this is this, that UK farming roughly can be divided very much into two. If I'm looking up to the north here, then on the west of the country it's predominantly pasture land, it's predominantly farm, uh, family farms raising animals. The eastern side of the country is predominantly vegetable growing arable. And I call that the plantation agriculture. And I use that word very carefully because when I was doing one of my degrees, I remember a book called Plantation Agriculture by a guy called Courtney. And he said, plantations are defined as that form of agriculture which is based on foreign capital, monocultures and migrant workers. And I, I can picture all places across the world, but Lawrence and I were talking, that over... Plantations are always well away from civilizations because it needs large tracts of land and always involving migrant workers. And we have the same systems now in the east of the country as those tropical systems did. But for some reason, it's got unreported and yet the significance of it in terms of capital development is enormous. A character called Karl Marx said the whole development of capitalism was actually blazed not in the transformation of family farms into plantations. And I can trace crops right across the world and how they've all, virtually all moved from family farms on one side of the world to plantations on the other. Challenge me afterwards and I'll, I, I'll do that crop by crop. What this, and, but this is the key map to, to look at. If that map on the left is farming, then there's a big yellow blob that big yellow blob is arable land. That's land which is ploughed for grain and vegetables. The map on the right is the proposed voting that Brexit was going to deliver. This map was about two months before the referendum. And you can see the big red blobs are almost identical to the yellow arable lands. And at the referendum... That, those big red blobs voted three to one for Brexit. The northern towns delivered Brexit by coming in at two to one, but let's leave that one aside for the moment. Come back to me on that. 
Now, why is that? Is the question. Is it because there are monocultures? Do you remember? So the key part of plantations is monocultures. These monocultures on arable soils, and remember Marx said the same as me, that all source of all wealth is labour and soil. We have to point out that those arable methods are wrecking our best land. Though that arable land is on our best land, it's on grades one and two. But we're losing something like two million tonnes of soil, our best soil, each year through so uh, either air or water erosion. I'm a soil zoologist, so I can tell you quite confidently that there's half as many little soil animals in that soil as there are in pasture. Half as many earthworms as pasture, which is about half as many as there are in forests. To which I would also add, the loss of carbon from those soils is at least 1-2% to 2 of our total carbon emissions. I made that calculation and I think some government officials should follow it up and get a proper calculation of how much carbon we are losing. But it's a lot. But what I can't understand is there's almost silence on the matter. I bet most of you haven't clocked all that. And yet, uh, Andrea Ledson was resisting an EU plan to force farmers to have three different crops. She said, oh no, 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 this is beyond the pale. You know, and yet, that very simple measure would have meant there's rotations and what have, which would have improved those soils slightly. Otherwise, there is nothing making that land better. There's a few voluntary methods, but that's about it. So, I, but I don't think the good people of those areas were voting Brexit for that reason, unfortunately. I think it was this, don't you? The migrant workers in those areas. And what I want to say is that whatever happens with Brexit, I don't think this is going to change very much. The migrant workers feel in the fields is about 80,000, probably up to 120,000 in the east. If we come out, then I can't see that we're going to get, not have migrant workers. The difference will be, and Tim will confirm, they will come from somewhere else, not from the EU. The tipped off is probably Russia, Ukraine, Bangladesh, Sudan in the future. And I would like to discuss how we actually produce our healthy food, our fruit and veg, in a healthier way than this. Because this clearly has led to the crisis we're in at the moment. And people will still carry on buying those veg with the Union Jacks on, thinking they're doing good. So, the, one of the points I want to make is that labour seems to be lost in most of the analysis. We've got to figure it back into Brexit. Labour always seems to be lost. Just look at that cover of that book, this book. When I was writing it, I kept saying to the publishers, what's the front cover going to look like? Here, I've got an idea. And they said, oh, don't worry, it'll be lovely. It's fabulous. It's great. I took one look at it, and in about two nanoseconds, I said, this is a typical city view of the countryside, as if it's all beautiful and it's just happened, you know, without anybody actually in the countryside. It just happens by magic. And that's how I was kind of brought up when I was doing agricultural science, is whether, whether it was in the agricultural economics when the markets were doing it, or in agricultural science when science was doing it, nobody mentioned labour. It was all as if it just happened. It doesn't. Somebody has to put the stuff in the ground, look after it, and dig it up. That's for the crops. So, it's crucial. But... The one thing I want to lever into this discussion is that it's not just a matter of having labour, that we need labour to have proper living wages. And cheap food, this is where we get onto cheap food. Cheap food means cheap labour. There's no way around it, or is there? 
we're not going to convince many consumers to start paying more for food. Yeah, they're all dashing off to Aldi and Lidl. Everybody wants a bargain. Everybody wants to go at four o'clock in the afternoon to get a deal, whatever. We're not going to get rid of that mentality overnight. And I don't think we should, actually. But it does cost the earth, and it does require cheap labour to deliver. So how do we get around that? Farm workers are more difficult to organise than any other workers, so their pay is generally lower. This was rectified after the First World War, when Churchill set up the Agricultural Wages Board, which meant that individual farm workers didn't have to negotiate with the farmers, that it was set at a national level, that if you did that amount of work, you got that amount of money back. It also meant that there was sick pay, there was holiday pay, and whatever. And anybody working for any farm could just say, uh, this is the going rate. So everybody knew where they were. Even Margaret Thatcher kept the Agricultural Wages Board when she got rid of all the other wages board because she knew the perilousness of their situation. But then the coalition government came in and said, oh, we want to abolish the Agricultural Wages Board. And within three years, they had. There's a website under there called the Abolition of the Agricultural Wages Board. If you get this presentation, all the links are there to follow up. I thought I'd mention the Labour Party in this, so it's about time. The Labour Party are committed to bring back the Agricultural Wages Board, which I think is a start but we need much more than that. We need to start talking about how we deliver living wages to farm workers in rural areas. Labour have made mention of animal welfare. I've noticed them talk about badgers and looking after animals better. But have, uh, let's say they've been lamentable in the debate about the agricultural bill. I haven't, I've barely heard them say anything. When if all the rest of us are being consulted and involved or what have I mean, you, there's been virtually no opposition. So much so that when the agricultural bill was going through, I was appalled when Sir John Deadwood, whatever he's called, <laughs> made the, asked, said, how is it that we now import so much food in the last 25 years, it's gone up by nearly a half. It's gone up to, we now import nearly half our own food. He said, how has that happened when we've got the cap? And you can see the logic. Yeah, we've got cap, so why aren't we using it to produce more food? And I'm afraid the shadow agricultural spokesperson said, I don't know. I don't know why that is. And Tim and I would be screaming. It's because you've left it to the free market for the last 25 years. We've got no food policy. We don't know how to direct where the funding goes. We've just left it to the market. But they didn't seem to know. I just picked up the one tweet from Sue Heyman a couple of days ago, and she said, uh, how is it that Gove can promise stand to maintain the standards if at the same time is in favour of free markets? I agree with that, totally. That's fine. But I just wish she'd had it on the end. And leaving the single market won't enable us to keep the same standards. You know, I just wish she'd said that and said something like, so why don't we remain? But it wasn't to happen. Labour are saying that they're going to stay in the customs union. And that I'm pleased about because look at this. If you remember that table, the table top, that's the single market. The, the legs are the customs union. And what that means is food coming in from outside has to climb the legs to get onto the table. And those legs are the taxes, the tariffs which are put on these foods to discourage them from coming in. An example of that is, do you remember I said about the, the, the coffee beans and the cocoa beans? coming in and being roasted, raw beans come into Europe with no tariff on them. You can import as many as you like, no tariff. Once we've roasted them, 
there's a 7.5% tariff. That's to discourage the coffee growers and the cocoa growers from roasting them themselves. It then protects the people in Europe, the, the coffee roasters and the cocoa manufacturers, from that. So it's a, a deliberately protectionist scheme. However, that's not, that's only one tariff. There are something like 2,000 tariffs. And when you start looking at them, they're mind-bogglingly complicated. A sheep will have seven or eight tariffs on it, from its hind legs to its head to its offal to whatever. And each of those have been negotiated between Europe and other countries. Some of them are not the same, they're not the same tariffs as the same countries. So for bananas, for instance, uh, there was a, a Brexit minister saying, ah, oh, we can get rid of the, we'll get rid of the tariffs on bananas, That'll, so we can all have cheaper bananas. Uh, until somebody pointed him out that actually all the Commonwealth bananas that come into Europe don't have a tariff on them. That's because the UK lobbied the EU to not have tariffs on Commonwealth bananas. The only tariffs which are paid on bananas are those coming from South America, uh, made in plantations by big Amer American multinationals. So I would, I would stick with those tariffs myself. But it's debates like that, 2,000 tariffs, different ones for different countries. And I haven't mentioned the quotas. Before the tariffs kick in, countries can negotiate quotas on which they can bring in the food for nothing. So New Zealand brings in something like a quarter of a million tons of sheep into Europe as a quota before any tariffs kick in. So, oh, that's simple. Come out of Europe, we just renegotiate the, the quota. So Britain ne renegotiated the quota arrangement with Europe until New Zealand said, oh, hang on, you've got to talk to us about this, not, not Europe. We'll decide that, what the quota is. So the complexities around this are enormous. And then when you start sorting out the 2,000 agricultural tariffs, there's 15,000 tariffs on cakes and biscuits and pies and whatever, because they've got mixture of products in them. So the idea that when we move, when we leave without a deal, that all this lot is going to be just sorted overnight is monumentally bonkers. What leaving with no deal would mean is that the tariff all at the moment all around Europe would be all around Europe except Britain. So there would be a tariff wall on either side of the channel. If you're producing lamb and want to sell into Europe, you're going to hit a 40% tariff. If you're producing lamb inside Europe and want to move it to Britain, another 40% tariff. So there might be an argument that because of that we're going to produce more lamb. But DEFRA aren't reading it that way. They've already worked out that something like a third of all lamb are going to be slaughtered in order to keep the market prices high. Talk about lamb farms to the slaughter. And just to give you another idea of how immensely complicated it's going to be, the government has already submitted a 700-page document to the WTA on its plans for trading. Something like 20 countries, are, including Russia, are objecting to that arrangement. So, so the idea we can just wander off it and sail the seas is absolutely bonkers. And the, 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 the number of issues involved in those tariffs go way beyond the Corn Laws of 200 years ago. These are monumentally more complicated. And for what? What do we want that tariff-free? We want cheaper food. That's what Fox and Gove are all on about. It will enable us to have cheaper food. In two ways. One way is we can set up free trade agreements with other countries. Particularly, they're talking about New Zealand, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, and America. And what do all those other countries want? They want to get rid of their excess food production. All the same. We, we want to sell our financial services and our white goods. In exchange, they want to move their meat, 
the corn, the soya, etc., into the country without any tariffs. Then there's the other lot, the Tim Martins of the world, in Wetherspoons. I don't know if any of you have been in there recently, but when you go in, there's, there's beer mats, and there's, uh, there's, I think there's even a newsletter going out at the moment. And it all says the same thing. This gives them the opportunity to remove the tariffs on food. And this would bring in cheaper food. And there's one economist, a guy called Minford, who reads mod quotes all the time. He says, yeah, let's get rid of all the tariffs, all the regulations, everything. And we can get our food in for something like 20% cheaper. I doubt that figure. He's, he's ranked 45th out of 45 for getting predictions right in terms of in economists go. So I'm not banking too much on him. But the point is that quite a few are going down this road because they want cheap food. And it's just back to the corn laws. The, the industrialists wanted cheap food to pay the workers cheaper. And this is much the same. And what I was saying to Tim beforehand, my big worry is some people will be using this cheap food argument as a way of saying, well, we can feed the poor better than we are now. And I think there should be universal outrage against that. So, um, I think this mantra about cheap food and no deal needs to be exposed for what it is. So my idea, to get around this, is to use the EU subsidies at the moment... Tim mentioned the cap subsidies, they amount to about £3 billion. At the moment they all go to landowners, they each get about £100 an acre, um, for which they need do nothing. They, or they just have to fill in the forms to get it. And when I said that, uh, I mentioned the Duke of Westminster who got £400,000 last year for doing nothing. And Queen, she get, got about a third of a million for her land for doing nothing. Uh, the estate manager for the Duke of Westminster contacted me and said, this is a very poor way to set up a debate. Oh, this is uh, very upsetting. He said, we employ at least 80 people on our farm. So I wrote back to him and said, OK, well, can we continue the debate down at the famous hunting, shooting, fishing lodge of the Dukes, Dean at Whitewell, which we both know quite well. I never heard back from him and he didn't want to continue that discussion. So my idea is to use that money to pay workers. And my calculations are there's about 300,000 farmers and farm workers. So they could each get about £10,000 extra a year. That would bring it into their living wage. That might start encouraging people to move back onto the land. So we pay each of the, those workers about 10000 extra. I'm just going to throw in at the moment, though, how do we get to those people to pay that 10,000? We could perhaps have a discussion about that. Because we need to invest in our rural economies. You, I mean, you live in the cities, you probably don't see all the countryside I've just pleasantly passed through. Um, but for the next generation, it has to be more sustainable. We have to be paying more people decent living wages. Otherwise, we won't have a countryside in a few years' time. So we also need to stop exploiting other countries of their labour. We, basically, we're using their land and labour. And in order to do that, we're going to have to change land ownership and who controls the land. And in this process, I want to introduce this as a new form of Britishness. Do you remember I said about Peter from Norwich saying it was only towards the end of their referendum they started to talk about identity. And I think we've got to start talking about our identity. And I've noticed that just in the last couple of months there's been less about anti-EU and more about what we want as, as Britons. And I don't mean the red, white and blue sort of variety, but I do think we need to talk about who we want to be in the next 20 or 30 years. What do we want our country to look like in, not the next five, but the next 50 years? At the moment, we, we have a food trade deficit of about £33 billion. In other words, we import $66 billion, sorry, dollars, $66 billion worth of food, we export about 33 Just bear this, that in mind. 
we have a 33 billion deficit in food trade, what we could do with that money, that's what I want to raise. Because at the moment, we import half our food, and in the process of doing that, we use other people's land. We use twice as much land abroad as we do in this country. We create three quarters of our greenhouse gases abroad, not in this country. And I was saying to Tim, I'd like to know the figure of the amount of water being transferred across the world from dry zones into this country. I, I think it would be appalling. So, to help the planet, to help people in rural economies, and rural areas here, we need to start using those EU subsidies to start working, rather than just sitting in banks. So, the, both the NFU and the Incredible Edibles say that for every pound spent in a rural area on food, another ten sticks. In other words, the, the farmer goes and has a pint down the pub, you know, hires the decorators, paints that, the mechanics, what have you. It creates about ten pounds worth of money in the, in the economy. Um, so I want that to be spent on workers in the local economy where they will spend the money. That's the idea. Instead of it sitting in banks, it gets spent. Because we then use that to feed ourselves. And this is the one point I really want to get over is we're chasing off after the world for new food markets. Yet the market which is there is the one right under our noses. We're importing half our food. Why don't we grow our own food and feed it to ourselves? You know, the market is right there. It's right under our noses. And using the three billion to pay the workers would generate 30 billion. You're now talking about the amount which we're importing. We're generating 30 billion. And then use that, and that multiplied 10 times again, you're talking about 300 billion pounds. Imagine what we could do with that in terms of a social care system, the NHS. No taxes. All we have to do is grow our own food and feed ourselves. Not impossible. We'd need a lot of innovation and interesting entrepreneurs to think of ways of doing that. But we could do it. So the food crunch is this. Many people don't want to pay more for our food, their food. And we're not going to persuade people overnight. Yet the UK spends less on its food than anyone else in Europe. I think it's now down to 8 or 9% of wages is spent on food. We also happen to be the most obese in Europe. We also eat the most ultra-processed food in Europe. And we have probably the most migrant workers in the fields in Europe. There's a connection here, and it's because of this free market system driving everything down in this country. Cheap food costs the earth and relies on cheap labour. I suggest we start with the EU subsidies. Whether we're in or out of Europe, we can argue for changes in subsidies inside Europe, because other countries don't spend it the same. And start making the case that we subsidise, not just with EU money, ex-EU, but our own money. Just as we argue to subsidise the NHS, where we expect treatment at the point of, you know, when you're ill, what's the point of, whatever. We, we can say, there shall be cheap food, but we're going to subsidise that cheap food so that we produce healthy cheap food. Um, what, I was, what I was saying earlier on was, the idea of paying those subsidies to individual farmers ain't going to work. I think we should be putting that money to local authorities who then decide for their area where that money should go. So if you want to set up an orchard for Manchester, we grow fruit around Manchester. Short, food, short fruit chain into Manchester, not all around the world. So that we leave it in democratic control how to spend that money. It's not left up to individuals. And just to give you some ideas, the, I'm not just talking about the, uh, the artisans and the airy fairy sort of local food, which we all talk about. But I'm talking about the manufacturers, the Kellogg's, the Tate and Lars, the Heinz, which they should all be using our food, not Canadian beans. 
or cane sugar. But it's not going to be simple. We're going to have to bring back the research facilities we once had. When I, when I was a student, there were 32 research stations. There's only eight left. To answer these sorts of questions, we're going to have to bring science and research back. We're making a go in Todmorden and the Incredible Edibles, and I think even more significantly, Preston is something called the Preston Model. Check it out. The local authority there is saying we invest in our local systems in future so that the university, instead of just putting out a tender for all its meals, broke that tender down into bacon, eggs, whatever, so that only the smaller producers actually tended for that. The local producers tended for it. The rest of Europe can do it. I don't see why we can't start investing in ourselves. And there are examples there. And I would include the word localization in that, not just localization, which means foreign flavors coming into our taste. So the migrant workers actually would be, could be given allotments and what have you to produce the flavors they like, which would be fed into our food taste buds. So I'll just finish on my predictions. I, I, said, I'll probably, I said at probably the outset, the idea of coming up with a magic arrow for the morass and mess that this parliament has got us into, uh, you're not going to get an answer. But here's some of my predictions. More cheap food, if any form of Brexit, more cheap food will be imported. Obesity and ultra-processing will go up. Migrant workers will be less likely to come. Standards in future will be for an elite market, not for everybody. I think getting decent food to poorer people will be even harder than it is now. I mean, the food banks are just full of crap food, basically. Getting decent food is going to be harder. Um, I've, I've, la rural communities will be under threat all round, not just the land ones. And that we will need much more land-based research in the future. So to wrap that up, I think it's coming back to, and I'd like to see us debate much more about what we want to be in 20 or 30 years. What sort of Britain do we want? And if I could make, wave a magic wand over the process at the moment, it would be to have another vote but not in the next two months or three months. That would just be rancorous. You'd just be shouting and screaming at each other. I would like to see a vote in another two years' time, when, as Peter said from Nourish, we would have time to talk about our identity. We would be able to talk to each other in Weatherspoons or the pubs uh, and have a proper, a decent debate instead of shouting and screaming at each other. And if this talk, in any way leads to that, I'd be very pleased indeed. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Charlie. This is Food Thinkers series. There's a lot raised there. Um, monocultures, migrant and voting. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that one, by the way. Uh, We'll come to that migrant, the, the, your map, your two maps, I'm not sure it worked. Um, but we can talk about that. Uh, carbon loss of soil, we've got Mike Ham here, who's from the US, author of the, the uh, uh, US government's biggest environment uh, report about diets and the global, uh, the, the dietary guidelines for Americans. I wonder what you think about that, thought about that, Mike. Cheap food. Cheap food and cheap wages, downward pressure on the poor, will it work out quite as Charlie's pessimism implies? Is he in fantasy land about taking those 3.9 billion, by the way, subsidies, it is not 3 billion, and just giving them to the workers? The civil servant to me says, impossible, actually. Quite an interesting idea. Uh, Self-sufficiency. Bye-bye bananas, bye-bye pineapples, bye-bye mangoes. Just 
seen, giving him a time to get his brain going. Uh, the role of local authorities, the Preston model, getting engaged with food that you ended on, very interesting. Got lots of people in the audience who work in and on local authorities. So, roving mic is Nora. Questions? At the back. The rule is, can you say who you are, where you're from, please? And keep it short. We've got about 30 minutes. Hi, I'm Libby Oakden. I've just finished a Master's in Food Policy. Um, and if we can keep the Customs Union and bring back the Agricultural Wages Board, how then do we get supermarkets to pay farmers proper rates for their food and get better conditions for workers so they're not doing back-breaking 12 hours a day work in the fields at the behest of we have to have our cauliflowers now on the shelves. Do you want to answer that very briefly? Should we see how we go if we cluster them or we'll just get going with that one? Short answer. Please. Well, just, yes, that's the crunch, isn't it? That everybody wants cheap food. The supermarkets say we have to produce cheap food so we'll screw the rest of you down. That's why I say we do have to move some sort of subsidies in so that the supermarkets can still sell cheaply, but the workers get a decent wage in the process. I, I think the way to get the money to the workers, as I say, is to go to local authority level who then decide where they want what food grown, and then they automatically pay living wages. Preston have already increased the number of people on living wages by about twice within so a couple of years. So this is using contracts? Yeah, yeah. Libby, what's your answer to that? Only part of the story. Take, take, take the... Um, you've, you've got local authorities and, say, hospitals and schools yeah. purchasing food, yeah. but then what about people who buy their food in supermarkets? Yeah. yeah. Different market, basically. Yeah. Any thoughts anywhere from that? The counter view of this, let me throw in a question, is forget subsidies. Subsidies just go to the wrong people, whatever happens. Uh, they're open to uh, distortion of markets. Uh, there is a very strong cultural argument, social argument, for phasing out subsidies and phasing in the real cost of production. Mm. There are people here, Graham, from, do you want to come in? You've written reports about this. Who wants to come in? Uh, no, I'll leave it for a minute, Tim. Carry on with what you're going to say. Okay. Uh, anyone want to comment on that? It's full cost of production versus subsidies. Very important debate. You and I haven't had that, actually. Do you want to come in? Oh, no. Okay, the lady there, sorry. Say who you are. Caroline Seaman, East of England, farming fraternity. Uh, studying masters with the, uh, at the uh, here. Um, and I think it's great. And um, my 87-year-old father, if he was here, would say it's great. Let's produce what the market wants. Will the market pay? And that's not just about whether there's going to be enough money for us to make our great profits on the farm. But that's actually, is it going to be enough to cover the costs of production if we're producing what we want? And I must just say, I don't trust my personal local authority to be responsible about food in any way, shape or form, personally. Two questions, two issues. You're on. Does that work? Oh, yeah. While our food is we're in competition with cheap food from the rest of the, rest of the world, we're not going to pay the proper price, are we? That's the... Cheap food costs the earth, even Michael Gove's come to that. So we have to factor in all these other issues other than just keep on about the market. And that's why I think subsidies can be directed in particular ways to make sure that we have decent, healthy food in the future and still make money from it. But we have to eat it ourselves, we have to direct. By the way, bananas, you said we can't like, grow bananas. Do you know that the main banana variety in the world is, some, Cavendish. is Cavendish. And Cavendish is the name of the Duke of Devonshire because those Cavendish bananas were originally grown in glasshouses at, was it there? 
uh, Chatsworth. Chatsworth House. He, the, the man there, gave a missionary these Cavendish bananas, who took them back to the Caribbean, and there was a wilt disease on at the time, and these Cavendish were resistant to the wilt. So this Cavendish banana is grown all over the world. Well, we can grow them here, because this is where they came from. You know? I love the story. That the thought of banana greenhouses, Charlie comes back. He does, he's not serious, by the way. Oh, I am. Well, he's semi-serious. We could grow tomatoes and like that, so why can't we grow bananas? Well, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. What about the comment about local authorities? I thought that was the most radical thing that Charlie said. Do you want to come in there for that? Nora. So it's very good exercise for Nora here, by the way. Can I just say it's very handy knowing the, the chair, the, the leader of the council in Preston to yeah. influence, I, you know, but that's, that's, that's a that's, crucial part. That's a point. Are you coming in on that? Can yeah, you uh, thank you, Nora. Thank you, Tim. I'm uh, Matthew Thompson from the Cornwall Food Foundation. So. I've got a lot of trust for our local authority and we've just done um, an exhaustive inquiry of how our county farmers estate is used and we are being um, and you know I've been involved in that and I think we are we stand a chance of being quite intelligent in Cornwall about um, about a bit of a local food strategy it's going to take a while but I think um, just think about the bigger problem that you, but I, don't, I don't think that would work everywhere because you know not every local authority can get anywhere near self-sufficiency or indeed have an active food production um, base so it, it wouldn't work just like that but I'm sure that it's more complex but than your thinking. But point was to begin that sort of bioregionalism. Yeah. I think bioregionalism is great. What I would look at though is if you look at Kate Rayworth's donut and her provisioning matrix at the heart of it you, the market is one quadrant. We've also got the state which is where you come in with local authorities which is valid but you've also got the household and you've got the commons which we would call community and those are the sectors where if you are going to start either factoring in total cost production or put in kind of price distortion mechanisms to support it you would incentivize more production and uh, demand management in those other quadrants which are typically outside of all of the economy um, in total do you, do you follow me a little bit what I'm trying to say so I think I think what we're doing at the moment is by by this obsession with the market and making it an either or the market or the state we're ignoring a vast amount of provisioning that happens in the commons and in the um, in the household and that's where we should be looking at if we are going to make anything out of this I think that's a, it's a very interesting can, yeah, can I come yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact Preston make it clear that they don't want to be an old-fashioned state municipal uh, Place. They talk about a new municipalism which opens up to the community cooperatives and the space for people to come through with ideas. That's so, right. yeah. They're building anchors. They're, they're, the whole point there is yes. they've got their anchor organisations who are doing the buying and not just the That's authorities right. and the public sector. That's right. Do you think while Nora's running, take, burning off our calories even more, do you think that there's more possibility not of, of local authorities that Caroline didn't well, like much, but if it's more regional, I mean, picking up one of Charlie's themes about Britishness, when he was saying that, I thought, actually, the problem is Englandness. Uh, England doesn't have regions. It's England which lacks the identity. It's England which hasn't got the regions. But I flag that. For me, it wouldn't be Prestonism. It would be regionalism. Okay. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, Nick Mole from the Pesticide Action Network. I know this is the, the food research collaboration, um, and I completely agree that, that farm workers should be paid a proper wage, and that the full cost of food should be paid for, and that cheap food is costing the earth. But what's the driving um, the desire for cheap food, in part, and how do we address that? Well. We're at risk of siloing ourselves, and when we're talking about food, we're talking about production, but we're not talking about the cost of housing, the general you know, paucity of wages, etc., etc., and all these other social things that are one of the driving factors for cheap food. So how do we weave all of this together and make that brighter future? Because unless we start addressing all of that, taking this out of the silo, then that demand for cheap food is never going to go away. So put it harder... Why are you accepting the inevitableness of cheap food as the core of British culture? Nick is saying, go across the channel, more expensive food, cheaper housing. Yeah. Yeah. What's your answer? <laughs> let's, go, let's go abroad. Yeah. <laughs> Bring that to Cornwall, that's my other suggestion. Yeah. 
Say, say that. Bring back the corn laws. That's one just for you. To explain that. All my students know what they are, but everyone else... I'll, leave, I'll leave it to you. Do you all know what the corn laws were? Lots of people are smiling vacantly, thinking, what the hell are they? Go away and find out about them. 1815 to 1846, a series of corn laws were put in to put taxes on the importation of grain brought into Britain in order to protect the Dukes of Westminster, actually, and um, the British landowners. And basically, the new industrial interest, my great-great-great-grandfather was one of them, pushed to say, no, this is a tax on keeping food expensive. The more we can import food via the Baltic Exchange, which is now the Gherkin building, as it was blown up, uh, the quicker we'll bring food prices down. If you don't know about the Corn Laws, what we're doing at the moment is rerunning quite a lot of that debate. And if you, there's a film of the book there. <laughs> if you talk into the microphone. There's a film of the book there, and if you go on to the first one, it actually does cover the Corn Laws, and we nicked a bit out of Victoria where all the Tories got up and walk out, and there's the greatest... It split the Tory party for the next 100 years. No, 30 years. Uh, <laughs> quite a long time. The lady over there, there are two people, Lawrence and you, two. What was that other comment, right? Thank you. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a master's student here at City University studying food policy. Um, you talked a little bit about small-scale farmers and investing in them and all of that. My question is specifically with small-scale farmers, with the aging farmer population, oh, wow. the investment in new farms and new small-scale post-Brexit, if you have an answer for that. Uh, no. <laughs> um, I usually bang on about it, actually, that... Just to let everybody know that the average age of uh, farmers is now 60. So in 10 years' time, <laughs> I doubt if I'll be able to say that because quite a lot of them will have died. And also, it is the most dangerous industry to be in. A lot of old farmers are getting killed because they can't move out of the way of the machines and the animals as fast as they, when they were young. So this is part of why I'm banging on that we need to really put money into rural communities so that we have a younger generation coming through who have a decent standard of living, have a decent set of skills, and we're miles off it at the moment. You know, everybody tells me if we try and change that vegetable growing in the east of England, will British workers come in? And they all say, no. no. We need to change the whole dynamic of the going out to, to work on the land isn't a chore, it isn't back-breaking, but it's a pleasant way of life. Just to give you an example of that, if you ever go to Egypt and you go to the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens, ask to go to the Valley of the Workers. And in their tombs, their idea of heaven is ploughing the land. And can you see, you know, in other words, Working on the land could be fabulous. At the moment, it's awful. That's one of the dynamics we really need to change, but we can only do it with long-term investment. I think that's very well said. I'd just like to give a point of evidence. The average age of British farming has been 59 for about 20 years. Uh, it doesn't go up, actually. Because, they don't, because there are fewer of them. Yeah. There are fewer of them. Uh, but the point you're making, both of you making, is absolutely excellent, which is how do we have a food system which attracts young people in and what is possible. We've now got a queue behind you. Lawrence and then... Um, my name is Lawrence then. Cockcroft. I've been associated with the Gatsby Foundation for many years, but mainly in the developing world. Uh, my question to Charlie focuses really on the following. I think all, all that you've been saying is extremely interesting and very relevant. But you're also, in a way, challenging us to think more deeply about the future, whether we're in the Brexit situation or not. And what you haven't really spoken about, amongst other things, for perfectly good reasons, limited time, is the balance between cereal crops and livestock. Yeah. And I don't have a sense from what you've said what your vision is or what vision you would like us to have about whether or not the priority is to, for example, increase cereal yields and... Uh, whether or not, in your uh, view, the current allocation of land throughout the UK, including obviously Scotland, in terms of the emphasis on livestock is appropriate. And within that framework, 
the huge poultry industry is, of course, one of the main drivers of imported cereals. On the other hand, and I don't think you really said much about this either, with, if I might say so. About what, it, sorry? On the other hand, I'm just balancing what I've just said, because we, you haven't spoken much about environmental issues in, in the context of large farms, which are going to exist for some time, whether anybody likes it or not. Yeah. So the question is, in the context of large farms, is your vision one in which the environment uh, priorities would be a constraint on yields, or one in which uh, though it would not be a constraint? So, for example, if we adopt conservation agriculture on the scale it's adopted in the U.S., which is enormous, is that something which in this country would constrain yields? But my central point is the balance between cereals and livestock. Okay. If, uh, Lawrence, just pass it to the gentleman in red on your left, because, it, Mike, I'm going to demand you come in on this. Uh, go for it, Charlie. Just to say, I'm not so bothered about yields. Do you remember, it? I kept banging on, we're overproducing as we are now. So t to increase yields seems pretty pointless. I'd much prefer to increase biodiversity of a number of crops. So to have rotations instead of monocultures of cereals. In terms of the meat wheat balance, then I'm all for pasture fed animals. They look, it's looking after the land up where we are, the, the grade three and grade four land, which you can't grow much on. What I'm against is obviously the, what we call intensive agriculture, whereby those cattle are eating imported food. Um, and I'm, by imported, I mean imported from the east of England, not just from abroad. So at the moment, we're importing 800,000 pounds worth of soya, mainly to feed cattle. And that soil is being grown on ranch, or what was ranch land and forest in Brazil. I think that's obscene. It's just dreadful. But I think we have to acknowledge the role animals play on our poorer land where we can't grow those cereals. But I go back to, it's the diversity we need to get, we, we need to get, bring back in. And one of the curious things is that when I put that map of England, I don't know why it's against it, is it's actually written down the middle that is either arable or pasture. Whereas if you go to Northern Ireland, most of the small farms there are mixed. Yeah. They have maize, they have wheat, but they have animals which are eating that maize, not imported from somewhere else. And curiously enough, it was the EU that paid farmers in the East to get rid of the mixed farms so they could produce the plantations. And so we've I think we should have some subsidies to go back and make more mixed farms. That would, if I could do two things, it would have more mixed farms and more rotations. Nothing, you know, clever, but that would make a vast amount of difference. I think, to be fair to Charlie, there's a lot more about your question, Lawrence, in his book, which is He's slightly really, yeah. longer. Yeah. Mike, do you want to just come in? Let me go behind you. So, Mike Ham from Michigan State University. He has a 10 days ago and six months here in the UK. So I feel like I've jumped from one frying pan to another. Um, so Charlie, thanks very much. I learned a lot. Thanks very much for all the information and your thoughts on it. I guess kind of getting back to this issue of, of beginning farmers and small scale farmers, <clears throat> one of the things we've spent a lot of time working on in Michigan is how to help small scale farmers scale up a bit because in Michigan we've got 10 million people. You've got a lot more than that. But at some point, it's an issue of tonnage when you start talking about fruits and vegetables. It's not one acre of, of tomatoes. It's thousands of acres of tomatoes um, to feed that many people. Yeah. And so have you thought about kind of on the one hand, how here in, the U in England, let's say, would you start to bring people into farming? And then what kinds of support services would be needed to help them scale to a point where they're both viable and they're producing enough food that it's, it's actually make, starting to make a dent. I, wish I, I realize that's a really hard question. It's a, it's a little question there. <laughs> it's a massive one which we could spend the rest of our lives on. The but first it's right, part, but it's the, right. It's yeah, absolutely right. The first part is that access to land. A lot, a lot of people I know in London who would like to get access to land and they can't because of our, our patterns of land ownership don't allow that. I would much prefer to to have a debate about how we do get access to that land. And I can see that you could have a system whereby the people still own the land, but they enable other people to come and work on it. 
We used to have council farms, and lots of councils had farms. I, I would like to see those reintroduced as well. Um, but in order to do that, we also need the infrastructural to support that in terms of skills. Because one of the things I came across relatively recently was in terms of whether we're losing land to urban growth, will we have enough to feed ourselves? Somebody did a survey in the 1950s and said, yes, we can. But at that time, I think there were people around with the skills to do it. We haven't got the people with the skills to do it. And we've, we've got to start at the primary school, cooking, growing, all that, all the way through. Which comes back to his point, which I thought was a really good one, about colleges, actually. You do that much better in the States. Yes. Much better. We could learn. Let's go. We've got actually five questions. We've got ten minutes left. Uh, I'm Oliver de Miranda. I'm a retired academic. Um, Charlie... Your, your proposals are extremely interesting and, and in some ways inspirational, I would say. Um, I think there is one major problem, and that is that you are treading on the toes of just about every single uh, vested interest in capitalism in this country. So the question is, how do we propose so that that policy that you're proposing is going to be uh, implemented? in the absence of a movement from below to push it through. When we were working together in the 70s, it, was, it, it wasn't called the, the, the policy, it was called the politics of food. Yes. And it was directed at the creation of a movement. Yes. My argument would be that we should be rethinking again in these terms, in actually trying to create a movement yes in which your proposal would be raised as demands rather than framing it in terms of policy, which is uh, aiming at influencing power, okay. which you haven't got and Hell's, uh, Captain Hell's chance of in, in right. influencing in the absence of a movement. Okay. Okay, you're going to have 30 seconds on that, Charlie. Cause, cause luckily, gonna... luckily, I'm not a professor of food policy, so I don't have to stick to that line. <laughs> No, I'm for the politics. So when I wrote the book, I wrote it deliberately trying to mix the greens and the reds. I wrote it, uh, if you like, on the red side of the debate, trying to influence the greens to also see the Labour side, that it, it requires both of us. There's lots of aspects of the movement, from Totnes to Totmenden, of young, lots of people trying initiatives. The problem is, most of them are voluntary. And, you know, we've got to build into that that they need to be paid. And to get them on board... Uh, I would want to see that they see the politics of it as well. They're not, you can't just grow your way out of it. You can't just eat your way out of it. We, have to, we actually do have to challenge neoliberalism and capitalism. But I do accept, Alvarez, that that ain't going to be overnight and it might be past my, my bedtime before we see that <laughs> emerge. Okay, and there's the issue of blue, the blue to the colour spectrum of Englishness. Mm. There you go. There is. Okay. Hello, Lisa Jack, um, Professor of Accounting, <coughs> University of Portsmouth, but I'm about the only person who writes about the food industry from that point of view. You do. It's fantastic you're here. Thank you. Um, I hope this is clear because I'm only just analysing the data that I've collected. But the bigger pro there's an interesting problem underneath, which is the use of the word cheap food. Yeah. And I'm following Michael Carolan from Denver in saying we actually ought to be talking about affordable food. And part of the problems are actually in the middle of the supply chain. We talk a lot about the retailers, the food service and the farmers, but actually it's the buyers and the middle people where all the, if you like, distribution, the fighting over, it's all negotiating at a discount and it all works on a marginal costing basis. Really, we have to understand that better, which is what I'm trying to do at the moment. And look at, actually, what does it mean for food to be more expensive? And in fact, we're probably only talking about fractions of pennies, yeah. in some cases, over a large amount. Yeah. So we've got to rethink our idea of discounting and marginal costing, and also recognise the fact that it is an increase in income from all sources and all sides, as the gentleman was saying. It's likely to increase. There's some interesting ideas coming out of Canada where I've just been on this. 
But I just think, actually, the movement comes with looking at the more obvious places where, in fact, the people that might orchestrate a move towards a fairer system are in the middle, and those are the people we should be manoeuvring. This is a wonderful opportunity, Charlie, while you're going to give us a signal. On the 30th of April, the Centre for Food Policy is running the latest of our city food symposia, and this is going to be a very big all singing, all dancing discussion about what sort of food system do we want, actually. So this discussion is very appropriate indeed. But Lizzie, your point is incredibly well taken. Charlie, I'm not going to give you uh, a chance to respond because we've got two more and we've got about three minutes. A the gentleman just try. there? Gentleman just there? And then over here, the gentleman. Hi, thank you. I'm Tom Wilson, Tradecraft Exchange. Um, You've touched on it a little bit, Charlie, but haven't maybe gone into a huge amount of detail. And I'm interested in your thoughts on the structure of supply chains. And given that supermarkets and big food brands and big commodity houses are so dominant, and that that dominance prevents, we might say, the kind of um, establishment of fair and equitable relationships in those supply chains. And I just wondered uh, if you could apply some of the imaginative thinking that you've put into things like the subsidy system to how the structure of supply chains allows fair prices to flow down to farmers. What you're saying, I'll be harder than you, is my old friend, so I can be harder. Um, the really interesting big questions Charlie is raising is about the relationship of investment and workers and the land and the countryside to food, but not enough attention on the food system as a whole. I would have to argue that we want shorter food chains. I'm talking about getting the food locally into the, into the shops. So, for instance, around our, our way, there's a farmer who grows a million brassicas. And at one time, all he did was supply Liverpool and Manchester. But as do and everybody else now supplies Liverpool and Manchester. So his brassicas go all the way around the country. And this, to my mind, this is bonkers. We need shorter food chains. But we need, in order to do that, we still need people to make money out of it. That's why I keep coming back to we make money out, out of the market we can see in front of us. We need to eat more of our own food. But that's this where is, we make Jack's point about yeah. we need to understand the money flows better. It's a very good point. The yeah. gentleman there. Um, I'm Peter Sims from Greenhouse Think Tank. Um, I I just wanted to pick up on a few different points that were made. Um, so we've recently been doing some work uh, looking at if we shifted investment from investing in infrastructure, which is often has high carbon emissions, we're, so we're, um, towards creating jobs and have a jobs focus um, in a sort of to 2030 time frame if we want to have a chance of avoiding climate change. And a lot of that, those jobs are actually in agriculture. And, and if you did that, whether and you localise the supply chain, not just the production, whether you can cut out some of those middlemen and therefore look at the, the point that was made over there to do with um, supermarkets and if they hold the buying power, so if you can cut that out. Um, and I, I very much agree with your points to do with um, mixed farms and small mixed farms. We've done some modelling around that, which I'd be interested to talk to you about. Um, but this point about if you want to fund the, the system, there is a huge amount of investment that's going, but it's all going into infrastructure. None of it goes into jobs. And it's people who not only matter, but are going to hold the key to the shift towards sustainability, towards solving some of the environmental things around agriculture. So I wonder whether that's a key point to make. Yes. <laughs> 